we've been talking about um, sort of biological turn in cognitive science over the last 30 or 40 years. And um, in the previous discussion, uh, we focused on the applications of evolutionary theory to cognitive science. What we're going to talk about today, and again, um, we're just going to hit on some of the major themes and ideas of this area of study, is that branch of cognitive science that, again, it's, it's not a new branch of study. That is to say, there were people studying these uh, some of these ideas in the mid-20th century. We'll see a famous uh, cognitive psychologist, Jean Piaget, a little bit later, and much of his work was done before the advent of computers and before the heyday of cognitive science. But um, the, uh, the sort of blending of the cognitive science approach and the study of infants and children has really blossomed again in the last quarter century, 30 years or so. So we'll, we'll sort of uh, look at some of, the, some of the major results and some of the major ideas in child cognition. But we, of course, as with our discussion of evolution this time, uh, uh, evolution in the previous time, we're only scratching the surface of the, of the depth of the subject. Um, First thing to say about studying infant and child cognition in human beings is that human beings are unusual animals from the standpoint of the length of their juvenile period. In fact, humans are born um, by the standards of other primates. Humans are, are born hi highly uh, prematurely. Um, uh, the, the equivalent, for example, a, 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 a newborn chimpanzee is pretty much equipped, to the extent that you can make these comparisons, seems to be um, equivalent in development to a nine-month-old child or thereabouts. So children are, uh, human children are born at, um, with, it, uh, <laughs> In a, in a highly, um, not only juvenile, but helpless state compared to many other animals. Why is that true? Well, one of the major reasons is simply that the head size of human beings, of infants, is so large, even after nine months gestation, uh, that a longer gestation would simply be too dangerous to the survival of the mother. So uh, a human child is born at the latest that it, that it would be safe for the mother to give birth. Um, but that means that the, that the human infant is, uh, again, rather premature by other animal standards. There are terms in biology for, um, for these properties. Uh, humans are referred to as Altricial animals. Altricial meaning having uh, slow developing uh, or a lengthy juvenile period, um, as opposed to precocial animals, which are quickly developing, mature at an early stage. To, to be a little more cautious, generally biologists don't talk about altricial and precocial animals. They talk about altricial and precocial traits of various animals. So by some standards, horses might be altricial animals, for all I know, but the fact that they're able to walk on the, the day that they're born um, means that you could call them, as far as walking is concerned, precocial animals. Humans are largely altricial animals. We're born in a very helpless state. We have an extremely long period of um, juvenility of, and um, which depending on, well, I mean, there are various markers. For example, when human children wean, um, when they uh, get weaned, when they're, um, when they're, you know, able to walk, uh, 
when they're able to participate in, uh, in you know, groups or when they're able to, to work in adult society, when they're off on their own. By many standards, people refer to the juvenile period in, in human beings as encompassing what we would call infancy, childhood, and more recently, adolescence. So depending on who one talks to, one could say that human childhood extends to about the age of 20 or 21. Um, our main concern in this discussion is going to be with infants and relatively younger children. But the fact of the matter is that human beings take a very long time developing. We spend a lot of time in our younger years assimilating the culture in which we're, we're growing up, learning the language, learning the ways of the, of the, you know, of the community in, in which we've been born, um, learning about physical objects, learning professional skills. These are, these are aspects of human childhood that uh, re require an extended period of time. So in some ways, we are the poster children for, you know, altricial animals. Um, there are, by the way, I have on this slide, oh, and I've been hiding behind this thing. Um, I have on this slide um, a baby kangaroo. Marsupials also tend to be altricial. And in fact, if you, you know, I often see these, um, they're born, uh, baby kangaroos are born extremely helpless, like human infants, and uh, they spend a long time, baby kangaroos spend a long time in their mother's pouch. I sometimes see photos of, a, you know, a child kangaroo hanging out in its mother's pouch, and I'm thinking they should, they should give the mother a break already and sort of leave that pouch, and, you know. Um, they're, they're just too old for this. But anyway, they, you know, they're also altricial animals. Marsupials in general are altricial animals. One of the things about being altricial is that it also places demands on the adults in the community. It's not just that, I mean, there are many animals, um, some reptiles, insects, uh, fish, where the infants are born, and uh, this is not all reptiles, by the way, uh, but there, there are many reptiles, and there are insects and fish, where the child is born and um, the parents are gone. The, the parents just aren't around, so the child is on his or her own, and the, the responsibility for the parent ends with the conception of the child, and that's it. Uh, mammals are not like that, birds are not like that, and um, in the case of human beings, because we have such an extended period of childhood, this places large constraints on the adult population. The adult population has to devote attention to, for infants to feeding and caring for the infant, protecting the infant, um, then over time, teaching the infant and child. Um, so adults are placed under, uh, adult humans are placed under uh, heavy constraints because of the altricial nature of human beings and because of the relative helplessness of their children. One of the, uh, the sort of, you know, uh, corollaries to that is that if you are altricial, um, if you're going to be born helpless and have a prolonged childhood, it really helps to be cute or interpreted as cute by the adult population. Human beings look at this picture of this baby and this little kangaroo and we tend to get this, you know, adult humans tend to feel this sort of protective urge toward creatures with juvenile characteristics. That makes sense. In other words, this is something that for adults, um, we, it's, it's part of our biological equipment to be ready to protect and ready to take care of um, 
creatures, and particularly, of course, human beings, who exhibit juvenile characteristics. There was a really interesting essay by the evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould um, quite some years ago now, where he talked about the increasing juvenilization in the, the rendering of Mickey Mouse as a cartoon character. And he showed this, uh, this picture, this diagram, showing Mickey Mouse as he went from the 1920s up through 1990. And um, the, 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 the thing being that if you look at the evolution of the way in which Mickey Mouse is drawn, the, I don't know if this is entirely conscious on the animator's part, but what they're doing is giving him more and more juvenile features. His eyes are getting bigger, his head is getting larger relative to his body, his nose is getting less pronounced, it's, his face is getting more squat, he's a little chubbier by the end than he was at the beginning. So these, this development is to make the, the animated character look more and more juvenile, look more and more like a child. The, uh, it was, um, my belief is that this was, in some sense, this had to be conscious on the animator's part in that they were trying to make Mickey Mouse more cute. Whether they uh, interpreted that or whether they identified that as trying to give Mickey Mouse more juvenile features, I'm not sure. Maybe it was just kind of instinctual that they changed his look to, to look more juvenile. But this is, a, this is an interesting case where the deliberate choices of the animators are exploiting the, the adult audience, um, and I guess it would, I mean, probably also children as audiences, but certainly the adult audience to feel more warmly toward Mickey Mouse. At the beginning there, he looks, looks kind of like a mouse or a rat, actually. <coughs> but by the end, he looks, he doesn't look anything like a mouse, actually, but he, but he looks more and more like a child. Why has there been this blossoming interest in infant and child cognition? Uh, we're, now that we've, we've sort of set the stage biologically that humans have this prolonged childhood and uh, helpless, relatively helpless infancy, and so there's a great deal of mental and cognitive development that goes on over that time, why is there this blossoming interest now over the past quarter century or so? One thing is that it's, it's become much, much easier to study children than it was even 50 or 60 years ago. Um, Alison Gopnik, the child cognitive psychologist, uh, wrote at one point, and I think she's right, that the advent of the video recorder, just the videotape recorder, was to the study of children's cognition kind of like what the advent of the telescope was to astronomy. Once we were able to videotape infant behavior, then we could carefully go over what infants were doing in, before there was an ability to, to you know, cheaply and excessively ex um, record, uh, you know, just get a get a, a an experimental record of what infants and children were doing. It was harder to study them. You could give them, you know, sort of tasks to do and watch them do them and take notes, but so much detail would be missed. So the advent of video recording really had a huge influence on the study of childhood. There are also, um, from the cognitive standpoint, there are philosophical reasons why it might be interesting to study child cognition. We, especially toward the beginning of the course, we sort of talked about cog cognition through the adult lens, talking about the, the tasks that adult thinkers have to accomplish, judgment and pu uh, puzzle solving and, uh, and so forth. And so those were, um, those were tasks that were uh, 
sort of relatively tuned to adult performance, and the models that were made were models of adult performance. And increasing, um, an increasingly convincing argument is that in order to really study, in order to understand adult cognition, in order to understand mature cognition, one has to understand it developmentally. One has to understand the stages by which we come to the, you know, the, the expert or adult perspective. For adults who understand, for example, certain things about physics or understand certain things about the biological world, what are the stages by which we come to understand those things? That developmental lens, it tells us a great deal about what are the, what are the characteristics and potential limitations um, of the level of our adult understanding in, in these areas. And in this sense, I, I mentioned here the ambivalent legacy of the computational metaphor. We discussed somewhat earlier that um, the, the emphasis of many early AI projects, artificial intelligence projects, was to focus on what was considered to be highly intelligent behavior. Very prominent early examples included, th included things like um, interpreting chemical spectra, uh, doing mathematical integration, playing chess. Um, these are tasks that educated adults do. It turned out, as people studied intelligence more and more, that the most difficult things to model, the most difficult things to get a computational or algorithmic representation of, were those things that we know how to do by the age of five, like move around a room without bumping into things, or understand a simple story, or vision, which we spent some time on earlier before. Young children, by the age of three or four or five, are exhibiting the properties of, uh, the kinds of properties of vision that are still challenging for computational models. So, the, in this sense, that, that computational metaphor might have held back in those early years um, a, a sort of uh, more active study of infant and child cognition. These are, these, these are the things that are changing over the last quarter century or so. Now, I've been talking about the last quarter century or so. Um, the, 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 the best known figure in children's cognition, in studying children's cognition, wa was uh, the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget, who, um, he lived to a ripe old age, he, he lived into his 80s, but most of his work was done in the mid 20th century. Um, and he really pioneered, you can think of him as sort of the, the grand, you know, the sort of grand uh, theoretical pioneer of the study of children's cognition. I've, Piaget wrote a, a shelf full of books, at least, in the, in the course of his lifetime. He was quite prolific. He's not easy to read. Um, if you pick up books by Piaget, many of them are still in print, you find that they are, they're not technically very difficult, but they're organizationally rather difficult. They almost read in some cases like lab notebooks where he's just taking notes on, on uh, what children do in response to certain challenges and tasks. Um, so he's, he's not easy to read. And uh, he, there were, his, his ideas developed over the course of a lifetime. But what I'm trying to do here is fit on one slide, if that's possible, sort of the, the, the basic foundation of uh, the Piagetian account of children's cognition. First, and I have this up at the top, Piaget took a zoological approach to children. He was interested in, in children, uh, uh, human children, from the species standpoint, he wasn't particularly interested in individual differences between children. So he didn't care much and didn't write much about uh, 
whether some children achieve certain cognitive milestones before others, and what kinds of uh, educational interventions could be done. In fact, he tended to think, it seems, seems to come through in his writing, that, that um, the variation along that line was of second, secondary importance to the things that all human children share as, as members of the same species. So he, he was really a biologist. You could think of him as a biologist first and, uh, and a, a psychologist in the service of his study of biology. Piaget outlined, he, he basically broke down the development of children's cognition into uh, stages and very often Piagetian theory is equated with a kind of stage theory of development of, of children's thinking. The main stages that he, uh, that he identified, and again, first of all, I have three listed here, sensory motor stage, concrete operational stage, and formal operational stage. In his writing, he subdivided these stages and expanded upon them and elaborated on them, so there are many, many more substages and things like that. This is a very rough outline. But broadly speaking, uh, the, the idea is that children up until the age of about a year and a half um, ha are driven mainly by perception, immediate perception, and uh, are not used to thinking in terms of the kinds of operations that they then begin to master as they move past the sensory motor stage. The kinds of operations that I'm referring to mean things like taking the viewpoint of others or uh, undoing a certain operation, physical operation that one has done, or understanding the idea of abstract number. There were many sort of um, interesting features of young and infant behavior that Piaget identified that at the time he identified them seemed to be were surprising, actually, considering that people have lived with infants through in th all of human history. Many of the things that Piaget noticed about the sensory motor stage and about the concrete operational stage were things that seemed puzzling to people, in part because they had not really systematically studied children before that. The, the, the tasks and the themes that preoccupied Piaget throughout most of his work were things that would be related to what we would call mathematics, uh, even higher mathematics and physics. That is, um, he would look to see, he would um, observe uh, how children regarded objects. Are they permanent? Are they solid? Uh, how do they move? And so forth. He was interested in how they were able to, um, how children were able to take very different kinds of viewpoints on scenes or ideas. Um, the early stage, the properties of the early stage, Piaget called egocentrism, meaning children had a very difficult time uh, understanding that what they, um, what, what they were able to perceive was not what everybody was able to perceive, or even to, to, um, to, to identify the idea that other people might perceive things differently. So the egocentrism is a property of the sen sensory motor stage and perhaps early concrete operational stage. And over time, as the concrete operational stage um, uh, proceeds, children are better able to do what uh, Piaget called decentering, and adopting other points of view. He looked quite a bit at the kinds of mathematical operations that if you've taken a course in group theory, you'll see that these are central ideas of group theory. The composition of operations, the reversibility of operations, the idea that operations might have an inverse, um, the idea of an identity operation. These were, the, of, of course, 
the idea was not that young children would understand the symbolic representation of group theory, but whether they would understand some of the basic ideas that later get studied formally in group theory. Um, Piaget was interested in how children understand numbers, how they understand sets. Um, so these were the, 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 the focus of many of the experiments that Piaget did. He, uh, he had this sort of grand theory of uh, children moving between stages and substages according to processes that he called assimilation and accommodation. They're very broad terms. Uh, roughly speaking, what he meant by accommodation was the uh, uh, looking at new situations in ways that, that uh, induce the child to rethink or change or move uh, between one stage and another. So accommodation is, are the, um, the, the, the influence, the, the experiential influences. Um, accommodation is a response to the experiential influences that cause one to rethink and move between one stage and another. Assimilation was more like uh, the, the, the kind of thing that, you know, um, added, uh, ex added experience to a particular stable stage at which a child was. In other words, if a child would, is at, say, a particular stage in the concrete operational stage, and he or she sees some new phenomenon that he, can, he or she can fit well into their stage of thinking, then that would be thought of as an example of assimilation. Um, and there were many, many sort of classic Piagetian experiments. All of this may seem very abstract. Let me give you an example of, there are many of these, but an example of a classic well-known Piagetian experiment that gives you a sense of the way that he would think, ab think about and, and examine children's cognition. So um, here's, a, here's a situation where on the left, you see that there are two identical glasses that are filled to the same level, A and B, with water. If you show those two glasses to a child of about the age of five or six, um, and say, um, which of these has more water in it? Or does, does you know, which of these, could be perhaps which of these glasses would you prefer, but which of these glasses has more water in it? Then children will say that they have the same amount of water. The, the two glasses are equal in that sense. They have the same amount of water. Now you take the contents of glass B and pour them uh, into a cylinder, a tall cylinder. And then now you have, and you do this in front of the child. So now you're presenting the child with A and, the, and C, the glass C, and you've just done this pouring operation right in front of them. And now you say, which of these has more water in it? And up to a certain age, children will reliably answer C. The, the cylinder has more water in it. The, there are a number of ways of thinking about this, but one way of thinking about it is that um, the, the, what's a missing idea here? A missing idea for the child is this idea of reversibility of operations. That is, the child has just seen the contents of B get poured into C. They could imagine, therefore, the contents of C getting poured back into B, and you're back at the same place that you were. So the in ability to reason about things like in invertible operations should enable a child to say that the, the quantity of water has not changed. Up until a certain age, though, um, children will make this mistake. That's, a, that's an, an interesting observation, and it demands some explanation. What's missing in the, the child's um, cognitive understanding of physics or mathematical operations like reversibility that mean that he or she can't see that 
this, that this would apply here. Um, I should say that, you know, Piaget wrote the, these, he, he wrote extensively, and he pretty much founded in the 20th century what would be the modern study of children's cognition. But many of his ideas are no longer um, unchallenged. In particular, Piaget's ideas of sort of coherent stages of movement between children's thought are, um, they're widely challenged, and I think it's fair to say that the, that the consensus among those who study cog cognition in children is that children don't move that way in, in these coherent stages. What do I mean by coherent? They may still um, experience stages of thought about particular situations. Piaget felt that the stages were sort of broader than that, that when you, for example, brought into your you know, intellectual quiver the idea of reversibility of operations, that that idea would then naturally spread to all kinds of other situations. In other words, the stages moved in this kind of intellectual progression as opposed to a task-based progression. I don't think too many people believe that anymore. And, and um, so, the, the, but the, the crucial thing about in talking about Piaget is not that he got all the right answers, um, but that he was asking interesting questions and making interesting observations about the things that children could or couldn't do. One of the most um, uh, fascinating areas of children's development and thinking has to do with social reasoning. It, it's sometimes called the theory of other minds. So uh, I'll explain this particular picture in a moment, but let me describe the, this is not a Piagetian experiment, by the way, but it's an experiment in the Piagetian spirit, you could say. Um, the, let me describe this basic experiment that uh, you can do, if you know a four or maybe five-year-old, um, you, could, you could do this experiment. Um, it's harmless. The, but here's the idea. Um, a child is brought into a lab setting and the, the child is shown uh, a box of, a box labeled M&M's, an M&M's box. And for simplicity, I'll make it a male child. So he is asked, the child is asked, uh, what, what's in this box, do you think? And he says, M&M's. You open the box and show that inside the box of M&M's, uh, the, the box labeled M&M's, actually pencils. And the child is surprised. The child, you know, he goes, oh, pencils, wow. And now you ask a crucial question. Um, you could do this in a variety of ways, like a puppet enters the room who hasn't been there. And you say, if I ask the puppet what's it, you know, you, I've now reclosed the box. If I ask this, the puppet what's in the box, what do you think he'll say? Or you could do it with a new person comes into the room and you say, here's a new person. They haven't seen all this conversation that we've been having. The box is once more closed. If I ask this person what's in the box, what do you think he'll say? And the child will say, pencils. And that's a little weird, right? I mean, person just came into the room they didn't see this conversation. They see a box labeled M&Ms. Why won't they make the, mis the mistake that the child just made? Not only that, but what's even weirder is that the child now seems to think that he always believed there were pencils in the box. What, what did you think bef before was in the box? Pencils. It's very odd. Um, past a certain age, when you ask, do the same experiment with children, They'll, you know, whatever, six or seven, um, and you say, you know, what will, what will this person say is in the box? They'll look at you like you're crazy. You know, obviously this person is going to think there's M&Ms in the box. They think it's a trivial problem. But up until the age of about five or so, um, it's, a, it's a puzzling problem. And, and 
they don't see, again, as uh, touching on themes that Piaget did study earlier, the child doesn't seem to be able to reason from the point of view of another mind that might have different ideas about a situation than they do. And that even extends to themselves. They're, when they're asked to reason about how they thought about this box labeled M&Ms before, they just say, I thought there were pencils in there. So there's a clear and interesting development of understanding other minds about this. Now what about this picture? When my son was four, um, he loved this book called Goodnight Gorilla. I love the book. If you, if you have a little kid, or you know a little kid, um, it's a great book to get. I'm sure it's still in print. It's a very funny book. This zookeeper goes around saying goodnight to the animals in the zoo, and unbeknownst to him, this little gorilla has stolen his keys and is unlocking the cages for all the animals as the zookeeper is going around. Now, my kid loved this story, and uh, he laughed at it, and you know he thought it was really funny. And knowing about this other minds experiment, I, when when he was about four, I asked him, looking at the looking now look at the, the cover here. It is made very clear, even from the cover, that the gorilla has the zookeeper's keys and don't tell the zookeeper. I, I am the only one who knows that I have the keys, and you do too, looking at the picture. But the zookeeper doesn't know. Anyway, I asked my kid, does the zookeeper know that the gorilla has his keys? And my four-year-old son said, yes. And I was thinking, how could, <laughs> not only, you know, that's so interesting that he believed that, but if he believed that, why did he like the story so much? Since it seemed to me that the story was based on the whole idea that the zookeeper didn't know. These are puzzles. But this theory of mind is, again, one of the things that's most actively studied in children's cognition. And finally, I should mention a line of work that has to do with children's understanding of uh, infants' understanding of the basic physics of, of objects. Um, a very famous Piaget study on object permanence had to do with, I, I'm kind of waving my hands here about the, the exact parameters of the experiment, but something like um, for a, an infant, say, under six months old, um, you present the infant nearby with a, a favorite toy, and the infant will reach out and sort of bring the toy toward him or herself. Um, and, uh, and also, under other circumstances, you show that given if there's a blanket someplace, the infant can lift the blanket. So we know that the, the infant likes this toy and will bring the toy toward himself, and we know that the infant is able to lift the blanket. Now, you take the toy, this favorite toy, and in full view of the infant, put it under the blanket. All that's now required if the infant wants the toy is to lift the blanket and pull the toy toward himself. We know that they're able to do both those things, but they don't do it. They, and to Piaget, they sort of behave as though the object isn't there. And this was, again, uh, one of the sort of tenets of egocentrism to Piaget, that if you can't see an object, it must be gone. Things do seem to be more complex than that, however. And in more recent studies, uh, and by more recent I mean over the past few decades, there have been quite a few studies involving infants' understanding of objects. So let me show you just a diagram of one, one of these studies. Here's the idea. You place an, you place an infant. These are, um, I haven't actually done these experiments, but I'm told <coughs> that they're not always the easiest things to do because you're dealing with, you know, four or five month old infants, um, very young kids, and they're not always that focused, and sometimes they get fussy, and you know. So um, 
so you know what the the version of the story I'm telling is a is a somewhat abstract and cleaned up version. You place the the child in you know um, at a lab table, and then this top row is showing a sort of board or screen that can be brought up and then lowered backward. So you can take this screen and bring it up or lower it backward all the way to the table. And what you're seeing in that drawing is showing the screen on the table and then being brought up and then, um, I should do it this way, on the table and then being brought up and then here's the screen full view and then we're bringing it back and then bringing it onto the table. Now, that's the, the infant gets used to that. You do that enough so that, you, and basically what you're measuring is how long does the infant look at these situations. So once the infant is used to this, you know, this little motion that you've been doing, they get a little bored and they're not looking at it that, that cautiously anymore. Now, you take an object like this block in this second row here, and you have the, the screen in front of the block, you bring up the screen and you lean it down and it bumps into the block. Children note that, okay? So you take the screen, bring it up, and it bumps into the block. Now you try another version of the experiment. It's kind of a magic trick where the, the block can be moved away and, you know, moved under the table outside of the infant's sight. So you bring the screen up in front of the block, move it, and then move it all the way down to the table. The block has disappeared. It's a very simple kind of magic trick to play with an infant. Um, and they look a great, great deal of time. They look interested. They spend much more time looking at that situation, that third situation, than they did at the second situation. The natural interpretation of this, these are pre-linguistic children, you can't ask them what they're thinking, but there seems to be at least a clear indication that they are surprised that the screen was able to move all the way back down to the table. What happened to the object behind it? That, that sort of uh, contradicts the egocentrism idea of the object permanence experiment. After all, if infants are confused by this third scenario, it, it would be because they expect the screen to bump into the block. They expect there to be evidence of a block behind the screen. I'm going back to the previous slide now. Those, are that, those types of experiments in which people measure looking time or measures of sometimes uh, children are just given a nipple on which to suck of a baby bottle, and then the measures are how, you know, how much time or how vigorously they suck the baby bottle. And there are only certain things you can sort of measurably get an infant to do to register surprise. But there are other sorts of experiments dealing with the same notion of how infants think about objects. For example, if you have a uh, a screen put up, and you take a doll and put it behind the screen, and you pull the screen away, and there's one doll sitting there. Um, the infant is not terribly surprised. If you show the you show an empty table, you move a screen up, you put a doll behind there, and you take a second doll and put it behind the screen and then move the screen down, and there's only one doll behind the screen, the infant looks surprised. Does that mean that infants count? Well, the usual term that people use in both infant and animal cognition is a kind of pre-counting skill called subitizing, which applies generally to only to very small numbers of objects, perhaps up to three or four objects, or sometimes it's used to distinguish that people can distinguish between, say, 50 objects and 10 objects. They can't, even if an animal or an infant might not be able to count to 50, they know that this quantity of 50 objects is much greater than the quantity of 10 objects. So it does seem that infants have this ability to do uh, subitizing. Um, how closely that maps 
to uh, ability, later mathematical abilities is a very interesting question and one that's, um, that's currently being studied. Um, if you have an object like a truck that moves behind the screen and uh, then reappears at the other end of the screen, children don't find that surprising. A little toy red truck moves behind the screen, they can't see it for a couple of seconds and then it reappears at the other end. They're not surprised. Um, if the truck rolls behind the screen and then doesn't reappear, they're surprised. Um, if the, uh, if the, uh, the, one of the interesting things is um, if the truck, I, I think this is true, at least it was the, the last time I read about this, if you have a red truck that moves behind the screen and a yellow truck that emerges from the other side of the screen, children don't seem surprised. So the idea that a red truck will continue on and can continue moving, that seems to be part of infants' equipment about understanding the physical world. Apparently they don't worry too much about whether an object might change color while it's out of sight. That's an interesting division. Um, there are many experiments in which infants will look at one object bumping into another and causing motion and that they understand that, that one object is the cause of the motion of another. Sometimes uh, these experiments have been done in such a way that the objects are given kinds of personalities so that um, they're, they're sort of anthropomorphic anthropomorphized so that uh, one, one object is seen to be sort of blocking another deliberately or pushing another violently, some things like that. And children seem to be able to, infants seem to be able to interpret many scenarios along those lines. And finally, I should mention an interesting experiment where if you have, um, you, it, if you have a dark room and you give a, a baby, an infant, a ball to feel, that is like a, a beach ball or something like that. They're able to feel this ball but not to see it. Then later you turn on the lights and the infant is presented with, so they haven't seen this ball, they've only felt it. Later you turn on the lights and you have the infant presented with both a cube and a ball. The infant will spend more time looking at the ball. So it seems that they have a link between their tactile perception and visual perception. All of these are sort of clusters of experiments. Many of them are still much debated. And admittedly, the, 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 um, the interpretation of these experiments has to be based on the perhaps relatively slender evidence of apparent interest, sucking time, looking time, things like that. Um, but, uh, so I think there's, there's still debates about the interpretations of ma many of these experiments. But it does seem that they, they, um, they indicate that, that, that infants have a much richer knowledge of the physical world than they were given credit for being, even by Piaget, and certainly by people before that. There's a famous quote from the philosopher William James who described the infant's world as a blooming, buzzing confusion. That's, that's an often repeated quote. Well, in many ways it, it probably is a blooming, buzzing confusion, but apparently infants are born with or acquire extraordinarily early, most likely are born, you know, this, these are things that are naturally acquired almost uh, under almost any environmental circumstances that infants do have some uh, knowledge at a very early age about the natural behavior of objects.